I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Welcome. Welcome to this very special Park at Home Good Friday edition. However you're watching, wherever you're watching, whenever you're watching, we are glad that you are watching. We are glad that in some sense you are here with us to celebrate and to remember the death of Christ for us and for the world. Now, for those of you who have been around Park Church for a while, you know that usually on Good Friday, we have a special worship service called Evensong, full of singing and uh, communion and scripture reading and prayers. It's one of the highlights of the year, and it stinks that we can't do it this year. By this point, um, the bread and the wine would have been prepared and the band would have been ready to go with those songs we just hear on Good Friday. The lights would be darkened, the candles would be lit, and most importantly, these seats will be filled. And tonight, they won't be filled. And on Sunday morning for Easter, they also won't be filled. It is a loss that we can't do this together. If you watched our Park at Home uh, from Sunday, you know that we talked about loss. We talked about grief in that service, about the experience that we all have when we go through change, when we go through transition that we perceive as negative. Walking through grief is hard. And for all of us throughout this pandemic, we have suffered loss in one degree or another. That's what's in the foreground of what we're experiencing right now. But on this Good Friday, on this unique Good Friday, I invite you to allow that to drift into the background and to allow a different loss to come into the foreground. The loss that God endured on that very first Good Friday when his son died on the cross. For Jesus, the son of God, he of course experienced the loss of his life, the loss of the breath that caused him to live, the loss of that relationship temporarily with his father. For God the Father, he of course experienced the loss of his one and only son who he loved. It broke God to the heart so that there was earthquakes when Jesus died and the sky went dark. Even the loss that God the Spirit endured, when that bond between the Father and the Son by the Spirit was temporarily broken. On this Good Friday, allow that loss to come in to the foreground. Because what this loss means for us, what this loss means for you, is life. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, however you're doing, what his loss means for you is life. Life everlasting, life in abundance life as we were meant to all live. It's because of Jesus. It's because of the loss that God endured on that cross. So on this special, unique Good Friday, we will lift up Jesus. We will sing to him. We will confess our sins to him. We will pray to him. We will sing about his blood in a moment. But first, let us listen together to the words of the prophet Isaiah about this man, Jesus. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, 
have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life into death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now let's sing together. What can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other found i know nothing but the blood of jesus sin atone nothing but the blood of Jesus not of good that I have done nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow No other found I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing but the blood of Jesus And this is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus
Jesus Are you weary Enter in Come and take the blood of Jesus And there is hope where none had been In the perfect blood of Jesus Your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that we have a God who, who washes us clean, who forgives us of all our sins? even while we were his enemies. The, the Bible has a word for this, and it's grace. God's unmerited favor. And so, trusting in God, trusting in his grace, we are free to come to him and confess our sins, to bring everything before him, trusting that he will forgive uh, John, one of the authors of the New Testament, he puts it this way. He says, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we asked some of you to confess before God. And this is how you responded. God forgive me that even though you've been with me throughout my life and been faithful to me, when difficult times come, I still walk in fear. God, please forgive me for not being the ideal father, brother, son, or boss. God forgive me for an entitled and selfish spirit. God, forgive us for when we don't believe you are who you say you are, and we take things into our own hands. God, forgive me for my self-reliance. Lord, forgive us for our sins and wrongdoings. God, forgive me for believing the false narrative in my mind that I cannot truthfully love my neighbor right now during this time. God, forgive me for my indifference. God, forgive us for not loving our neighbors and forgetting those around us who are in need. God, please forgive me for trying to be perfect in others' eyes instead of yours. Lord, forgive me for sometimes not trusting you with everything. God, forgive me for looking more towards me than to you. God, forgive us for the times that we get impatient with our spouses and our children. God, forgive me for the times that I don't have grace on myself or on others. Please forgive me times I focus on myself rather than fixing my eyes on you. God, forgive us for worrying about tomorrow instead of being fully focused on you today. Would you pray with me? 
Father, we come before you trusting in your grace and, and we confess our sin. Thank you that through your son Jesus we have forgiveness. In his name we pray. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. To you, O Lord, the God of all, with broken heart, I humbly call and see my sins against you, Lord, the sins of thought and deed and word in my distress I cry to thee be merciful to me O oh God be merciful to me O oh God be merciful to me That last song is based off Psalm 51, a prayer to God for mercy and for restoration. We're going to lead you now in a time of prayer from Psalm 51, where we'll read some lines and pause for a moment to prompt you to pray on your own. So with the words of Psalm 51, let's pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. 
Lord, you have heard our confession. Forgive me. In your mercy, please cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Lord, please show me what I need to see. Teach me wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Lord, restore and renew me, heart, soul, mind, and spirit. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Lord, make your presence known to me and restore me to your joy. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's strange, isn't it? The thing that we're also rightfully concerned about, the thing we're trying to avoid that's causing us to be anxious, maybe a little paranoid. It's something we can't even see. It's invisible. And yet, we have seen it has turned the world upside down. It's, it's crashed economies. It's spoiled sports seasons. It's, it's ruined businesses. It's canceled graduations. It's closed schools. It's closed churches. And yet, if we had it in our hands right now, we wouldn't even know it's there. We can't see it. And yet, the power of it, the power of its effects are undeniable. Just look in any intensive care unit. Look in the faces of any nurse or doctor who is on the front line, who is, who is dealing with things. Look at the news Look at our world, look at our businesses, look at our schools, look at us right now. We're sitting at home rather than here on Good Friday. Hasn't it been amazing to see the power of something that we can't even see? Hasn't it been startling? What it has reminded me of is the power of what we can't see, the power of the invisible. On that very first Good Friday, the day that Jesus was crucified. His death, his crucifixion was anything but invisible. It was as visible as it could be on purpose. It was as public as it could be. He was nailed on a cross high outside of the walls of Jerusalem next to two other men in order that everyone who was coming in to the city or out of the city could see it like a billboard put on display an advertisement that says, don't get caught doing what this guy got caught doing or else you will end up like him. It was a public, visible, humiliating, painful, shameful way to die. And it was put on display so that all could see it was anything but invisible. To most who were watching, they probably thought to themselves, here's a man who's getting what he deserves. To some who were watching, those who were following Jesus, they were watching from a distance and they looked as their Savior, supposedly, was nailed to that cross and was dying as a failure. And they were walking away full of disappointment, full of crisis. Then there were others who were watching who wanted Jesus there who wanted him nailed to that cross, and they were thinking to, their, uh, to themselves, we have gotten our victory. It is true that might makes right. And yet, there was one other man who was there watching, a centurion, a, 
a guard in the Roman army whose job, ironically, was to make sure that Jesus died there, that no one came and saved him, took him off the cross. And he might have started his day thinking, yeah, here's another man who deserves to die because of whatever he's done. But when he saw the way that Jesus died, when he saw the way that Jesus breathed his last breath, he didn't just see a man who was dying. What he saw was the Son of God on that cross. As Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record for us, when he saw the way that he died, that he breathed his last breath, the centurion exclaimed, Surely this man was the Son of God. What this centurion could see that was invisible to most other people's eyes in those days, and it's invisible to too many of us still today, is that this wasn't just another man who was dying. This wasn't just a, another failed Jewish Messiah. This wasn't just another criminal being executed for what he had done. This was something entirely different. This is someone entirely different. This was in some way that the centurion probably couldn't even put his finger on. This was God's own son. Listen to how one theologian puts it. He writes, Through the visible suffering and death of this man Jesus, an invisible event took place which did not and could not happen through the suffering and death of the two criminals, nor, for that matter, any other human being. Why not? Because Jesus and he alone was this man, a man like us, yet at the same time different because in him God himself was present and at work. It was God himself who died on that cross. So who was this God, and what did he do through the suffering and death of this man, Jesus? The Apostle Paul has summed it up in one sentence. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. I'll try to explain this to you in a few words. It so happened that in this man, Jesus, God himself came into the world, which he had created and against all odds, still loved. He took human nature upon himself and became a human like the rest of us in order to put an end to the world's fight against him and also against itself and to replace our disorder by God's design. In Jesus, God hallowed his name, made his kingdom come, his will done on earth as it is in heaven, as we say in the Lord's Prayer. In him, he made known his glory And amazingly enough, he made it known for our salvation. To accomplish this, he not only bandaged, but he healed the wounds of the world. He helped mankind, not only in part and temporarily, but radically and for good in the person of his beloved son. He delivered us from evil and took us to his heart as his children. Thereby, we are permitted to live and to live eternally. It happened through this man on the cross that God canceled out and swept away all our human wickedness, our pride, our anxiety, our greeds, and our false pretenses, whereby we had continually offended him and made life difficult, if not impossible, for ourselves and for others. He crossed out what had made our lives fundamentally terrifying, dark, and distressing. The life of of health and sickness, of, of happiness and unhappiness, of the high and the low, of the rich and the poor, of the free and the captive, he did away with it. It is no longer part of us. It is behind us. In Jesus, God made the day break after the long night and spring come after the long winter. All these things happened in that one man. In Jesus, God took upon himself the full 
load of evil. He made our wickedness his own. He gave himself and his dear son to be defamed as a criminal, to be accused, condemned, delivered from life unto death. As though he himself, the holy God, had done all the evil we human beings did and still do. In giving himself in Jesus Christ, he reconciled the world to himself. He saved us and made us free to live in his everlasting kingdom. He removed the burden from our shoulders and took it upon himself. He, the innocent, took place of us, the guilty. He, the mighty, took place of us, the weak. He, the living one, took place of us, the dying. This, my dear friends, is the invisible event that took place through the visible suffering and death of the man hanging on that middle cross on Golgotha. This is reconciliation. His damnation, our liberation. His defeat, our victory. His pain, the beginning of our joy. His death, the birth of our life. We do well to remember that this is what those who put him to death really accomplished. They didn't know what they were doing. These deluded men and women accomplished by their evil will, by their evil deed, the good that God had willed and done with the world and for the world, including the crowd at Jerusalem, including each and every one of us, including me, including you. Yes, it's true that this invisible threat is real. It's affected us all. It is powerful. But on this unique Good Friday, please hear me. For as powerful as this invisible threat is, what happened on that cross in the invisible event that we just heard about is infinitely more powerful. Yes, this invisible virus has, has changed the world. It's, it's changed things for weeks, for months, maybe even years to come. But listen, what happened on that cross 2,000 years ago has changed the world forever, not least of all your world. So that now no sin is too bad. No, no sickness is too sick. No darkness is too dark. No one lost is too far gone. No prison is too secure. No power is too threatening. No death is too final. Nothing can ever change what happened on that cross. The way that Paul puts it in Romans is that neither death nor life nor, nor angels nor rulers nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so for as much as the power of this invisible virus has changed our lives, this Good Friday, invite the power of the cross, allow the power of the cross. When God gave himself for you. Allow that to change your life today, tomorrow, forever. You know why I love the excerpt that I just read? Why I love it so much? It, it came originally from a sermon that a great theologian preached, actually on a Good Friday service, to a room full of criminals, of people who were not unlike the man to Jesus' left and his right. It was preached to a bunch of prisoners in a prison in Basel, Switzerland. To men whose, whose actions, whose, whose lives, whose behavior, whose, whose sin was judged by society to be so heinous that it was better for them to be locked up than for them to be allowed to be free like the rest of us. And yet, the message, the truth, the power 
of the cross is just as true and real for them as it is for any of us, as it is for me, as it is for you. It's because we are his, we are God's, not by our own doing, not because we're good enough or we've proven ourselves or we've deserved it or we've earned it, not because of something we've done or undone, but we are his by grace, by God's unearned and unearnable gift. We are his by grace and grace alone. Now I invite you to sit back and listen to this truth sung to you in the words of this next song. Clear away the distractions, turn it up a little bit, and allow the words of this next song to penetrate you, to go into your heart, into your mind, into your soul, and allow these words to change you, to comfort you, to give you hope, to give you uh, faith as we move forward. Listen to this song now.
Who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. It's a powerful song. We are his by grace. Thank you for being with us, for worshiping with us, for praying with us, for celebrating with us, for remembering the death of Christ for us and for the world. We would love it if you would share this video with your friends on Facebook, Instagram, so that more and more people can hear about the power of the cross, the power behind this invisible event that happened 2,000 years ago. And we invite you, of course, to join us again at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning on Easter for our very special uh, Easter morning park at home. Now we're going to close with these good words from Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, talking about Christ. He writes, in him we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ together all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.